Tired of filling out endless online forms or submitting the same documents across different member states? Well, whether you're starting a business, moving, registering a vehicle, studying or working abroad, these processes could be much simpler thanks to the once-only principle. As the name suggests, this principle ensures that people and businesses only need to provide their information to public authorities once. It's a game changer, saving time, cutting through red tape and improving the user experience. But turning this vision into reality comes with challenges. Joining us today to dive into this topic is Jacques-Felix Wirtz, Director in Government and Public Sector, and Xavier Lisois, Managing Director in Digital Transformation at PwC Luxembourg. Together, we'll explore the opportunities and challenges of implementing the once-only principle, its role in digital transformation, and its impact on Luxembourg's public administration. I'm your host, Carlos Santos, and this is Tech Talk, technology made simple over a cup of coffee. So grab your favorite beverage and let's dive in. Hello and welcome to a new episode of Tech Talk. Today, we're going to talk about the once-only principle system, which aims to simplify interactions between citizens, businesses, and public administrations. Intriguing, isn't it, Chris? Yes, indeed. I think it's a great topic. And to help us navigate this matter, we're joined by two fascinating guests. Today, we have Jacques Felix with us and Xavier, who's also a, a veteran, I would say, of, of Tech Talk, because we've had him a, a couple of times Correct. Uh, to bring us their insights on the topic. So welcome to you. Welcome as well. So my name is Jacques Felix Sirtz. I'm a director uh, at PFC Luxembourg and responsible for the local public sector advisory. Um, being responsible for the local public sector advisory, I think we always look at what are the most promising the priorities of the local public sector. And one of the key priority of our actual government, of our current government, is the once only principle. So that's the topic uh, we would like to address today. Thank you. Xavier? So I'm Xavier Lizoir, Managing Director in the Advisory Practice of PwC Luxembourg. I'm specialized in digital transformation from public and, pri and private sector, and I have a long track record of uh, simplification and digitization in the, in the public sector, including also the implementation of the one Sunday principle. Perfect. You anticipated our first question. <laughs> Indeed, but it's good. It's good. <laughs> yes. So let's get uh, started uh, and uh, dive into the topic. Uh, first question is uh, simply to explain the once-only principle. What is it about and what is its uh, significance for public ser services in Luxembourg? So I would like to, to start, uh, I would like to begin actually with a personal example that I recently uh, experienced and that highlights actually some of the challenges that we face uh, today. Um, so recently I undertook a house renovation project. Uh, and explored as well what are the, the state aids that are available that I could benefit from. So I went to the website quiche.public.lu in order to see what are the, the state aids that are available to me. Um, and I started to complete the paperwork, the paperwork that was requested on the, on the website. Um, I received then a letter actually from, uh, from the ministry uh, requesting additional documents that I have to, to submit including tax uh, certificates uh, from previous years that have to be signed as well by the ACD, the Administration des Contributions Directes. And this was kind of like the first uh, hurdle. Hmm. Uh, so I had, I had to, to raise, raise a formal request uh, to the ACD in order to get those uh, tax certificates. Um, so I had to wait a couple of weeks. I got them. Uh, they arrived by post. Uh, but then, to my surprise, I did not get all the tax certificates from the previous years. There was one missing. Um, why? Uh, what I found out is that because I moved from one commune to, to another commune, um, the tax uh, department responsible for my tax certificates was not the same anymore. So I had to contact again the ACD, but the other department in order to get as well the other tax certificate. And once I got all this documentation, then I provided those set of, of data to the, uh, to the ministry. I had to wait another couple of, of weeks until I got then a, a final reply. And this showed actually uh, the, the layer of complexity. So I think at the time I was kind of like stressed as well because I, I did not have 
any uh, um, visibility of the dossier on, on what has to be done, what I have to submit. And so uh, this was kind of like a, a painful moment I, I lived. I think that's a bit like the showing the the opposite that in one's only principle, but <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, if you, so so it shows actually that yeah. the current system, how it is at the moment, is a is a, a hurdle, a struggle for for both the citizens, but then as well for the employees, because the employees as well they have to wait in order to to get a reply from the citizens, but they are not sure that what the sub the citizens submit is the, the real documentation that they need. And so it could bring that the, the whole process takes several months until, until it gets to a final outcome. So how would you explain the once-only principle in one phrase then? So uh, the once-only principle is that the citizens and the businesses that they do not need to provide uh, the same information twice or multiple times but only once, and then it's up to the government, the public entities, in order to, to get that available documentation as well from the other public entities. Perfect. Perfect. I think it's a <laughs> great, 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 great explanation. explanation. But then maybe, maybe a question to you, Xavier, if you can um, explain how this concretely works, uh, how it's put in practice, maybe in Luxembourg, maybe you have a couple examples, or, or Jacques-Félix, if you want to complement, but Xavier, if you want to start. Well, I think it was a, a great example of the potential of the sim of simplification because the impact is both for the citizen and also for the administration because it creates a lot of extra work. And um, I think we could partially extend the definition also not to ask something they already know. Because typically in this case, it exactly. was what yeah. uh, an administration was asking, what another administration was already aware of. Mm -hmm. So that's that's also uh, an important step for, for, for simplification, just to avoid to create extra workload on one administration to ask, to explain to the citizen uh, what he's supposed to, pro to, to provide and then you more or less understand something that you need to ask to another administration and you don't know if you ask correctly, if you will, ask, you will have the, the right documents, if we have them on time, whereas everything is already available in the memory of the, of the I would say, public, uh, public ecosystem. And that's typically where we, we could consider to, um, to simplify the experience both for the citizen but also for the administration especially in a period where uh, government is, is seeking for, uh, for savings, uh, that's clearly also uh, a potential collateral benefit also of, of simplification. It's not only to please the, the, the citizen, it's also a very efficient way to, uh, to implement uh, a, a process and also to uh, gain important savings in the, in, in the process. And that's really without talking about technology whatsoever, is really in terms of principle to try to uh, not to rely on a third party to collect information that, the, that an administration already has. And this is also the aim of the current government. So when you look into the coalition program of our new government, coalition program 2023 to 2028, it's clearly written that they want to create an efficient, digitalized and transparent public sector. And so their focus lies as well on the simplification of the procedures. And one key cornerstone of this is the one's only principle. Yeah. And there will be also a major change in terms of mindset, because also for civil servants, it's just so easy to ask the citizen and to push back the burden uh, of the uh, of the workload and, and of the task to the citizen because very often they realize it's it's also for them a struggle to contact another administration because they will be asked about the legal basis about what and demonstrate but it's not easier i mean if between professionals they cannot find a, an easy way do not expect that citizens who are not aware of the details of the procedure will be better equipped to face this kind of changes, especially if they do it from time to time. So, uh... Indeed. Well, Jacques Felix, you mentioned the example of uh, the tax certificate, but in what other instances this could be uh, applicable, the one's only principle? Any kind of evidence that it be, could be about your salary, could be tax, could be about your diploma, it could be about anything that will help to uh, demonstrate your your identity, your revenue, your credibility, your compliance with uh, specific uh, measures to see if you are entitled uh, to some uh, some kind of benefits. All, all, all those documents, I mean, that are typically requested from the citizen or from the business, huh, because the principle is totally valid for in both cases 
could be relevant relevant because it's, it's a huge opportunity for for simplification. And from a practical point of view, I mean, Christopher uh, asked this question: How does it work uh, to put in place? So I think first, uh, what is important to say is to talk a little bit about the draft law. Um, so we mentioned before the coalition program. So when you have a look at the coalition program, uh, it's written there that the government will develop a legal basis for the once only principle. Uh, at the moment, this legal framework does not exist. So this legal framework to 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 uh, enable the use and sharing of the data between the ministries uh, and other public administration. Um, so there has been a draft law uh, that has been introduced in June 2024. It's the draft law number 8395 for those who, who want to have a, a look uh, in detail on, on, on what, what is written, written in the draft law. law. And, and uh, uh, the, da- the, the draft, draft law talks, talks uh, as, as well about, about the one principle. principle. Um, mm. So the aim of this draft law and the one's only principle is to simplify the administrative uh, procedures, for instance. Um, it should ensure that individuals, so the citizens and the businesses, they only need to provide the data to public authorities once, as we mentioned before. And and what is interesting as well is that the once only principle becomes mandatory for public and also the communes, so for public entities and also the communes. This means that the entities, they will be required to collaborate uh, and share information uh, internally. Um and I was reading through the the law, and I think there are some of the articles uh, I would like to mention because I find them very interesting, and I think it answers as well a little bit to your question, uh, uh, the one you just raised. Um, there's the Article 12. Um, it states that the public entities are required to promptly identify the information and personal data they can obtain from other public entity. That means they have to analyze first what is the data they have and analyze what is the data they need for all the requests that are raised uh, for their ministries. I think that's the the first important step for the the public administrations, the public entities to do, to understand what are the data they have and what is the data they need. So they have to identify this. Um, The Article 13 states uh, and talks about the once only protocol that has to be put in place. Um, So before any exchange between public entities occurs, the entities involved, they must formalize their agreement in a protocol. And in that protocol, there are a number of things that have to be detailed. For example, the contact details of the two public entities that are um, that are involved in it. So the the entity, uh, which is at the source of the information and then also the public entity that is the recipient uh, of the the information. Uh, They have to mention in the protocol as well the purpose of the processing. So what is the reason behind of this uh, data processing? What is the reason why uh, the data should be exchanged between those two public entities? And they have to give as well uh, information about the data. So the categories of data that will be exchanged and the individuals to whom that data belongs. I think that's already uh, one one first step what has to be done once the law has been voted. As I mentioned, at the moment is a, a draft law, but once the law has been voted, uh, so they have to identify uh, the data and they have to put in place the protocol between the two uh, entities. Um, but there are other articles that I, I find quite interesting in the <laughs> in the draft law. Oh, no. was so as I, I mentioned, I was reading through it, and I think it's important to to mention them uh, as well. One article, it's Article Nine. Um, it it clearly states that um, a citizen that is submitting a request to a, a public sector entity cannot be required to provide that information again uh, if that data is already within another entity, another public entity, or can be obtained from another public entity. So it clearly states this that it's mandatory for the public sector entity to uh, to request the data from the other entities. Um, what is interesting as well is that the public entity um, 
uh, must inform the individual, so the citizen or the business, for instance, about the personal information or data that is required for the processing and that it will obtain uh, from other public entities. So it means there is some kind of transparency as well. So it's not that the public entity will just use the data it got from another public entity, but it has to inform the citizen as well about this. And then the last article is Article 10, uh, because they, they mentioned that the citizen, he must certify as well that the data that the public entity got from another public entity is accurate. So um, this is like the validation of the data. So the citizen has to confirm that the, this is the right data. Um, and this brings as well uh, a sense, a layer of transparency to it and also uh, a, a layer of accuracy and reliability of the data. Xavier, you had mentioned uh, a few benefits of the once-only principle. Uh, well, clearly simplification, but also you mentioned efficiency and saving costs. Uh, are there any other benefits that you can think of um, that this principle brings? I think you mentioned also uh, trans transparency. I think it's also important. And uh, w when you were detailing the the, the different uh, articles. Uh, it remind me what has been present for uh, for some years in uh, in, in Estonia with system they call crossroads. And in, in this case, the citizen has full control of the information and just enable. So the information is is stored. I would say in some sort of a common repository to to, to simplify. And when an administration is interested in some data, then the citizen receives a notification and say, okay, I allow this administration to look at my criminal records. I, I allow this administration to look at my medical record. I allow and then and then you know and you could provide a permanent access a temporary access for a specific uh, purpose or um, p p permanently and that's where we are um, progressively uh, aiming at and not to answer your question yeah. <laughs> I'm aware, uh, is, is also when you say when the law uh, is voted I would say no they don't need to, to wait for the law to be voted to start the analysis <laughs> cle cle clearly yeah. it's, it's definitely possible to start now to look at the, the, uh, at the processes to identify the different documents to have uh, a catalog of documents to define them to normalize them and then to uh, to start to, uh, to, to be ready when the vote is there to move uh, to, to move forward you don't need low to start to perform an analysis. And uh, in your view, that should be sooner rather than later? Oh, I, I don't see an obstacle no. to, <laughs> to, to, to start. Huh? Uh, I, I mean, there, there are entities like uh, CTIE where they have huge business process analysis which have been um, implemented uh, or at least documented for, for the past few years. There's a lot of documentation and information available there. Huh? When it's done with sufficient details, all the information that now... We need to put them in perspective, to harmonize them, to have a common definition of the, all the different documents, which is not always the case. But but you have a huge, uh, I would say, uh, repository of material that you could already use to speed up the to speed up the process. And that's clearly where you you could see also. Uh, in terms of benefits, to get back to your question, uh, <laughs> uh, about yeah, the, the simplification, the, the, the time to market also, because it's much uh, much faster to deploy a system, to deploy a new, uh, a new process, uh, when you take into account uh, the information which are already available. A few years ago, I had worked for the Wallon region where we had to think about a framework to assess new law, to, um, let's say, um, to assess the, the extra workload to the extra burden that, that they could bring. And based on that, they could have a score and, and sometimes and say, ah, oh, if we change this and this in the process, would it make the life of the administration or of the citizen easier? And simply choosing the kind of evidence you are requiring. You say, ah, oh, but we have already this information there. Maybe we could have an equivalence and, and then a substitute. Instead of coming with something new and a new form and a new, and a new template or something, they would say, ah, oh, it's already there and there. And then you could have something which is, uh, which is already there that did not require a, a change in the system or much less impact on the system and went much faster to, to, to deploy. So... It was the same political benefit, it was the same purpose, but simply in the choice of the, typically in the evidence and the support document, it could make the life of everyone much far, much easier. So win-win. Oh, definitely. <laughs> so it, yeah, it's, uh, it should be for the citizens, it should be time-saving. 
time. Yes. It should be time. What you mentioned, the example you just gave, it should be time saving for the the citizens. It should eliminate the repetitive uh, tasks that uh, that been done. Been done. Uh, it should uh, reduce the complexity as well. Uh, to simplify the processes, uh, I think um, we mentioned in transparency, it should improve transparency as well so that the citizens know, understand exactly what is the data that is used for, for the dossier. Uh, and with this, it should lower as well the stress level for the, for the citizens. And also the, the, the quality, as you mentioned, it, either on purpose or by mistake, you could provide the wrong document. Or uh, even if we need to attach it in a form, you, you take the file which is next to the one you wanted to select, and then you have something which is completely irrelevant in the process, and it takes time for someone to realize it's not the right one and say, ah, oh, but no, you didn't provide the, the right document, and you, you need to send it back. When you reuse a document which has already been validated somewhere, the ones only, it helps also to, to, to speed up that, uh, that validation process because there was somebody already done it as long as it remains valid because that's also the important point. Not everything is valid forever, but again, you could put a date, a validation or whatever, uh, or a certification of content, and then again, you could speed up the deployment and the execution of the process. So I, th I think it's rather clear that there are quite some benefits to, to the one sending principle, but it's by, indeed uh, it's quite a lot of work to put in place. I assume, but it's in a way it's an investment to, for the future. Um, can we can we maybe understand from you the the challenges that the public administration would face when they are implementing the one only principle? Do you have? Examples to share on, on that aspect? A few things. We already mentioned some, the, the legal framework, huh? because also, to be honest, sometimes administration is not allowed by the law to, to share the content that has been collected for a specific purpose for another purpose. So, again, whatever you, you do, you first need to enable it le le legally. Then there was all the different aspects that have been already detailed uh, by Jacques-Félix about uh, the mapping of the process and the identification of the use case. And what would be also useful is the interoperability. So to have uh, not only a common definition, but also a common template, common structure, uh, because it's not only about document, but it could also be applicable to, uh, to data. And that's where interoperability, definition of, st of standards of content is also very important to optimize uh, the, the, the reuse. Um, one basic example that we are very often confronted with also as a as consultant, we are uh, requested to provide a CV, but in a specific format. And depending on the tender, we have a slight variation of the flavor of the format that we are uh, requested. Okay, uh, I, I mean, they, they are... Uh, um, I would say open source standard to the, to describe a, a, a CV. That should be the way. Uh, then the recipient could present it the way he's interested. But pushing again the burden to come uh, to ask every time for the same uh, for the same content, but with a slight variation that does not change anything in terms of value to assess the, the profile of the candidate. Uh, just to to provide a, a practical case that we are very often confronted with. Well, this is the clearly a way that uh, simplification could be uh, could be implemented. It, it's not a major turnaround. It's it's a lot of tweaks and adjustment that over time will bring a lot of value. Yeah, I think as you mentioned, I think one of the big challenges is about the interoperability and the data standardization, because the data that is collected is not. Uh, it's maybe not stored in a standardized format, meaning that it's not formatted or, or structured in a uniform way. Uh, you give one example, I have another with the, the address data. For instance, one entity might store uh, addresses in a single field and then another entity is using the same address but split it into into different fields and not, and one, not one. And so it means that there is no data standardization. So I think one of the big challenges is the data standardization uh, between the different uh, public entities. And I think one also which is less technical, but it's more about the, the, the mindset and the habits that will require a lot of change management also in administration. Because uh, as I was saying at the beginning, they are used to push back the burden of the of the evidence to the uh, to the the entities that is submitting the request, and that will be uh, also important for them to to take into account this new way of thinking, this new paradigm, and it should not bring more work uh, to uh, them when it's well thought out. Normally, the whole process should be easier for everyone. So, it's not the point is not to push the burden on one side rather than than on the other. 
which happens sometimes. Uh, but here it's really, as you were saying, it should be a win-win situation when it's well thought through. Okay. And, uh, well, you mentioned all these challenges. Any suggestions of how to overcome these? Or how, how they can be prev well, managed? P part of it also in relation to what we were just saying about interoperability and standards. Standards does, don't need to be created in Luxembourg. Uh, there are also a lot of international standards from business, uh, from business uh, operational perspective or uh, defined at EU level. So let's try to also leverage them as much as possible before considering anything to be specific uh, locally. Again, that will help, the, I would say, the, the, the software editor when they need to produce something that will not be specific for Luxembourg, so it means Luxembourg will have it um, faster and cheaper. That also uh, makes, uh, means it's easier to, 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 to process and we don't need to train uh, and to answer specific questions about things which are unique to, uh, to Luxembourg. So that also helps to, uh, to to speed up to adopt that because this one suddenly is not only a national level that could because mm. especially in Luxembourg we are more and more in interaction with uh, neighboring countries and beyond. So also this possibility to to, to share uh, and as EU is providing a lot of interoperability framework for uh, multiple domains, why not let's say, transpose them and adopt them already locally for the the topics which are relevant? Yeah. That makes and, sense. And, and I think, uh, Xavier, what you just mentioned about, uh, so the one's only principle should ease the life of the citizens, but it should not bring a burden or an additional burden to the life of the employees. Um, and I think that's also one of the, the biggest fear at, at the moment. So we mentioned that it is a draft law. Uh, so when you look at the legislative process, um, there are uh, the opinions uh, that are gathered at the moment from various stakeholders. I was reading to one of the opinions from the, the CHFEP, which stands for Chambre des Fonctionnaires et Employés Publics, so the Chamber of the Public State Employees. And, and I will just quote what they, what they said in their, uh, in their opinion. So the Chamber acknowledged that the application of the one's only principle is certainly a positive development for citizens, saving them considerable time. However, it expresses concern that its implementation may not necessarily simplify administrative processes for, for public entities. So I think that's something that's, uh, that has to be keep, uh, kept in mind. Because the systems at the moment, I, I think they are not fully prepared to manage the seamless data exchanges. So I think that's one of the big challenges in order to make it uh, seamless, this data exchange. And not create an additional burden where one employee at one entity needs to find the files and then send it by post or by email to the other entity. This is not how it should be. Exactly. That's why it's important to make this distinction between simplification and digitization. Digitizing a complex process does not make the life of anyone uh, simpler. Neither for the IT people who have to implement mm -hmm. it, nor for the one who, uh, who need to go for it on either side of the fence. So that's why it's very important. And uh, that's why I was also uh, highlighting what you had mentioned at the beginning, the regulation, that they need to think about the, the, the process and isolate uh, the core components and the reusable uh, content. So, uh, so that then you can start to build new processes based on those content and uh, and really speed up mm. the, the, the collection. And clearly it works, it benefits bo I say both sides of the fence for the civil servants and for the, the business slash the, the citizens, definitely. Uh, great, very clear. Um, now let's talk about digital transformation. What role does it play in making the once only principle a reality? And maybe uh, are there any technologies or innovations that are key or will be key uh, to support this principle? Yeah, they are. They, they are but uh, again, technology is not to, to, to replace poor design and poor analysis. So that's why uh, I stress it again. It's important. Please do. <laughs> you cannot fix it with technology if it's, poorly de if it's poorly designed. So it's important to really capture the requirements and to try to implement the simplification in the design first. Afterwards, when you have a clear description of the documents, a clear definition, then you can ask technology to check if a document is already available, if it's still valid, if it's the right one that has been provided by the by the applicants all this could be done with traditional technology or even AI uh, for example to uh, avoid let's say somebody who had 
provide it a, a completely wrong document, wait for weeks to have a feedback saying, oh, by the way, that's not what I was expecting in that uh, in that field. That's something that could be that could be done. But again, uh, it's important to invest a bit more in the initial capture of the of the information because afterwards, the reuse should be seamless. So there's also a, a shift in, in terms of the mindset and the logic. It's not a quick and dirty uh, every time. It's you do it once, but you do it w well once. <laughs> and even if it takes a, a bit more of a cross-check or you need more control, because when the information is the ecosystem, is not meant to be uh, asked, uh, asked again. So it's really an investment to create an asset, an informational asset that would be then shared among all the different processes and uh, that the, a citizen could be interested uh, interested in so that's where uh, technology could uh, could help uh, most of it has already been around for years as was mentioning with uh, Estonia and, and others so there are places where the regulation and the mindset was I would say more in inclined to this uh, to this approach uh, but again uh, it's important to design it correctly and then to create uh, a sick, an open but secure ecosystem. That's the that's the other part where technology could play a role to ensure the, to to find a, a way to embed security without compromising the fluidity of the of the process. Again, a lot of design effort. <laughs> Because we talk here about information that is shared, and information can also be public. Uh, public information could be no, not public, but also personal data, uh, personal data of the the citizens that is shared between two entities. So. Uh, 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 it has to be made sure as well that uh, the data is maybe encrypted. Uh, we have to talk about uh, the access control systems as well that have to be put in place. The anonymization, pseudonymization, in case this is this is needed for for the uh, data exchange. Uh, so we talk here as, as well about GDPR, so the the, the general uh, data protection regulation. Yeah, and when it's combined also with digital ident identity, because it's been around for some time, uh, now it's interoperable. You have EU framework, uh, let's say, ensure, ensuring the interoperability of uh, of digital identity. So it means you can also clearly identify organ organization or individuals uh, playing a role in the digital process. So I think now all the building blocks of the Technological building blocks are, are, are available. Is really up to the, the legislator to allow it to be to allow them to be combined uh, si si seamlessly. But I, I would say, especially uh, if you go one step further, when this information is there, I was referring to AI just uh, just before. Is not only in the validation of the document, but, but also to support the validation of the process or to provide even advice, customized advice uh, for specific situation. Where AI could play a role, especially when the data are good, when the data are qualified, when the data are there, that clearly uh, it helps uh, to have, uh, um, let's say, um, qualitative feedback from uh, from AI from AI based system, and that's where also we could also consider some sort of savings because. There are also the challenge in Luxembourg to to see uh, all the civil servants, of a generation of civil servants, going to to retire, and, uh, and the challenge mm. to to find those those resources and this kind of skills. And maybe, uh, personally, I think that AI could be part of the answer. It may not be the only answer, definitely not, but also part of the answer to uh, compensate for the loss and maybe expand the level of service that could be uh, offered to uh, to citizens in this context and uh, to businesses. I think it's a it's a nice segue to the to the last question. I think before we wrap up, and you were talking a bit uh, about building blocks. So I mean, if we if we can't find a solution, let let's see. But what what would you see would be the immediate next steps? Let's say or milestones for Luxembourg public sector to embrace this uh, this once only principle. Both of you. <laughs> I think for for my side, I think uh, as uh, the law is still a draft law, I think the next step for me is to that the law the the law gets voted. I think that's uh, the first step that has to be done. But then, as Savi mentioned before, it does not mean that they need to to wait until the law gets voted in order to start working al already on it and to identify the the data they have, the data they need. But the law is a nice motivation. Always. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Do you have any guess on when would it be approved, voted on? Not at all. 
there's no deadline in the EU mandate by when it should be implemented mm. in the member state. I don't remember. No, I don't know. No. <laughs> it's, it's supposed to be a, a tricky question, but uh, uh, clearly, the, uh, as, as we were saying, it's clearly uh, but a huge potential for a win-win situ 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 situation, and you can implement it progressively because every improvement in one part of the ecosystem will benefit for the, to the whole ecosystem. There's really a network effect, which is a uh, um, I would say huge, and there's there's no small step. So any step that could that could be done will be valuable, and uh, also even if it's not to implement the the, the one sunny, this kind of analysis, which is based on the content, mm -hmm. is also very valuable to design a more uh, far, smarter approach to uh, to pro to collect and to process uh, data. So even without the the one sunny principle, it's important to think about the information as a valuable and reusable asset. I think you mentioned it, but just to clarify and be sure, because we've been talking a lot about Luxembourg, but this works across member states as well in terms of exchange of... Absolutely. That's why interoperability and EU framework and EU standards is even more important because if everyone is having his own standard, it's not on standards anymore. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> so at least we, we, we miss the, um, the, 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 the benefit that you could expect from this. So that's why I, I was uh, highlighting this because I, I spent some years in normalization bodies and things like that. Uh, it, it, it's important to, to think as big as possible and uh, sometimes investigate a bit about what are the standards in place and available and before deciding to create something locally. Because very often, uh, the, the creation of local standards is not driven by the need to have a, a local standard. Maybe it's, it's often driven by the uh, ignorance of existing standards. <laughs> um, well, that's uh, quite a statement, Xavier. <laughs> uh, to wrap things up, uh, I would like to ask you what are the key takeaways or advice uh, you would like to share with our audience? Who wants to start? Jacques Felix, let, you're let ready. Me, let me start. <laughs> um, I think the, the one's only principle is, uh, or sounds really good on, on paper. Uh, but I think the way to get there and to make it uh, functioning in a seamless way uh, represents uh, some, some hurdles. I think the way to get there, it's not, it's not an easy way. I think it's a way that takes some time. It's probably a long way as well. Uh, so it, it's something that has to be taken uh, seriously. We have to be realistic about this. It, it will not be in two months that we have a once only principle at, uh, within the Luxembourgish uh, public sector. So I think for the government, uh, it needs strength as well. Uh, and they have to be aware that they need to put a lot of effort in it in, in order to make it happen. Yeah, at least both the the consultant and the and the Luxembourgish worker in me are very <laughs> good to see to, to, to see that uh, taking place in, in, in Luxembourg. And as I was saying again, it could be piece by piece. It could be piece by piece, focusing first on one part of the ecosystem and then ex expand it. But just move, <laughs> just do it as someone uh, <laughs> mentioned in the past, but uh, that's really important to, to start because if you try to have the perfect model, uh, you will always be stuck with one detail uh, somewhere, so it's better to uh, to give the, the context, give the framework to, and then to enrich the, the, the content progressively when you focus on one, uh, on one sector and then you will see that you will have reusable asset for the next one and it's usually it's the first one that takes that takes time that needs to be done quickly and then you can really scale and uh, and ramp up uh, effectively so baby steps <laughs> <laughs> all right um i don't have any questions what about you christopher yeah, no unlisted questions we today no unlisted today what's no. what's going on you're very quiet is it uh, the the awful weather outside the weather outside yeah. probably <laughs> Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, it was thank a pleasure. Thank you for inviting yes. us. Our pleasure. Uh, and it was our pleasure indeed yep. to, have in, to have you on our podcast. So this is Tech Talk. Christopher, I want to test your knowledge. <laughs> Technology made simple of our cup of coffee. Well done. So what's your favorite beverage, Jacques Fenix? Ooh, um... I go for uh, a chai tea latte okay, with I thought... uh, soy milk. Wow. Okay, that's very uh, specific. Yeah, very yeah. specific and complex. <laughs>
What about you, Xavier? I will be on this opposite as you may see on the table. I just have a bottle of water and that's usually my main source of... Simplification. <laughs> Simplification. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. And that's all for today. This is Tech Talk, technology made simple over a cup of coffee. Don't miss out on any future episodes by hitting subscribe. Thank you for listening to this episode and see you in the next one.